Hello, everyone. Welcome to Brainwaves. I'm Brandon Staglin. Thank you for joining us today. Today, we're going to talk about a, uh, a life-wrenching condition, bipolar disorder, which fortunately has received a lot of popular attention recently, thanks to movies like Silver Linings Playbook and popular memoirs like K. Rod Phil Jemison's An Unquiet Mind. Uh, unfortunately, it's received a, a bit less, relatively less scientific attention in terms of how to develop better treatments for it. Um, and but the good thing is uh, that a few scientists, uh, some funded by Embro, have been working hard on developing better treatments for it in recent years. One of these scientists is Dr. Colleen McClung of the University of Pittsburgh. She's made newsworthy discoveries um, in this field over the last couple of years, and she's won our 2012 Emro Johnson & Johnson Rising Star Research Award. Uh, I'm going to be interviewing her today on Brainwaves. And, uh, if you'd like to ask her questions during the interview, feel free to post a question using the little Q&A icon on your browser window. If you mouse over the left side of the window, you can see it, or um, it, it's there. Uh, and, I, and Colleen, I'll relay them to Colleen, and she will answer them for you. So Colleen, thanks so much for being with us on Brainwaves again. Oh, thank you, Brandon. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you back. So. Um, I wanted to ask you a few questions uh, about some of the great work you've done recently. Uh, so um, in your MRO funded research, you have uh, pinpointed a specific gene which, when it's suppressed, ha uh, creates a therapeutic action of mood stabilizers. So it's a sim single gene that future mood stabilizers can suppress to be effective. Um, how do you know this gene is so effective? And um, well, actually, let me ask you that question one second. I want to congratulate you on your the NAMH R1 research grant that you got uh, for for the work you've done in this area. Um, so back to the question. How do you know this gene is effective and uh, is implicated in bipolar disorder, and what is its effect in bipolar disorder? Sure, yeah. Well, thank you for, uh, yeah, for acknowledging our grant. We're very excited about it uh, and to be able to continue these studies. Uh, yeah, so we started this research with um, uh, with the knowledge that a treatment called uh, valproic acid, or um, trade name is Depakote, a lot of people might know it by that name, um, can be can be fairly effective in um, the treatment of of bipolar disorder, particularly bipolar mania, and um, and so this is this is a widely used drug. It's one of the first line treatments for bipolar disorder. Uh, but it's not a perfect drug. It, it has a lot of side effects. It, uh, it isn't effective in all people. And, uh, and actually, this drug was originally found, um, it was an anti-epileptic drug. It was, it was one that was used to treat seizures and then was sort of accidentally uh, discovered as a treatment for bipolar disorder. And so we started, um, we started out with this drug, and we wanted to know what were the, the real therapeutic targets of, um, of this drug. Uh, because it has a wide range of targets, it, it can really affect the expression of a lot of different proteins. And so um, essentially, we, um, we decided to take a systematic approach and look at what particular targets of this drug might be therapeutic on their own um, and might be sufficient to really reverse um, manic behavior, uh, in, a, in this case, in a mouse model. So we're using a mouse that has um, a behavioral profile that looks very similar to people um, when they're in the manic state of bipolar disorder. And uh, I can discuss the mouse a little bit more if, if people are interested. But um, this mouse is really um, a nice tool to be able to look at different therapies uh, that might be um, a new way to treat bipolar disorder. And so we took the approach of, of looking at the, the known targets of valproic acid and just systematically testing them one by one, either through genetic uh, manipulations or through pharmacological manipulations with, with more specific compounds. And doing this, we were able to kind of whittle down to this particular protein, uh, HDAC2, um, which is a protein that's involved in the regulation of gene expression. Uh, and so, um, so we feel like this is, a, is really um, at least one, if not the most important targets of valproic acid. And so this then allows us to, to develop compounds that are very specific to this um, particular protein. Uh, which should have the therapeutic benefit of valproic acid, 
um, and maybe even have a stronger benefit since it would be more specific um, and not have a lot of the side effects that valproic acid has um, currently in, in the form that people take it. Fantastic. That's really great research. Um, so, so you say it'll, it'll be pro a fewer side effects, be maybe more effective that kind of the, mm -hmm. uh, the gist of how it might improve the patient experience of people with bipolar disorder. Yes, exactly. So it, um, you know, in, in the future, um, and we're testing compounds now actually that, um, that our, our collaborators at pharmaceutical companies have made that, um, that target only this protein. Uh, and so if, you know, if it has the full therapeutic potential of, um, of valproic acid, but on a much more selective uh, target, uh, target gene, then it, yeah, it should just, it should be a much better treatment. Uh, we'll have to wait and see, you know, well, uh, these are still studies in mice. So we'll have to see if we see the same thing in humans in clinical trials. But uh, the good news is that there are a lot of, of people interested in the targeting of, of these particular um, proteins, these HDAC proteins, because um, they've been implicated in cancer. And so many companies have started to create a lot of different compounds that are very specific, that target select members of this, um, this protein family. And so we can, um, psychiatry can sort of piggyback on a lot of the drugs that are being developed for cancer therapies and test then to see if they're going to be um, effective for bipolar disorder. Awesome. So that it wouldn't have to go through the, the same level of safety clinical trial. If it was shown to be uh, effective, it could just use that portion of the clinical trial process because it's already been approved for safety, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So if a drug has already been approved for safety, then it, it will just need to go into the efficacy trials. Uh, so it should be a little bit of a shortcut into um, the FDA approval process. Uh, so hopefully that's something that we'll be able to do in the future. Great to get the medications to patients faster. That's awesome. So, uh, so great. Uh, well, thanks for explaining all that. Uh, and then in, in related research, you've done a lot of work about circadian rhythms and the daily sleep wake cycles that we all experience and how these might be different in bipolar disorder. Uh, uh, you, you found some very newsworthy discoveries here and some of this was covered in NPR and uh, the New York Times. Uh, can you explain a bit about this research? H how do you know circadian rhythms are so important in, in mood disorders and, and why, you know, what, what is about them that's important? Yeah, so, um, so it's been known for a long time that people with um, bipolar disorder, um, as well as other psychiatric disorders, so uh, major depression, schizophrenia, um, have very uh, disruption, re really disrupted sleep-wake cycles associated with them. So um, people have, uh, you know, a lot of um, sort of irregular sleep patterns, or they have um, very strong responses to disruptions in their normal schedule. So, uh, for example, someone with bipolar disorder might be uh, kind of going along uh, pretty well, and then they travel overseas, or they work a night shift or something like this. And this uh, can really set them off into a manic episode uh, or a depressive episode. Um, and in the case of schizophrenia, even a psychotic episode. And so, uh, and with bipolar disorder, with people have psychosis associated with it, with the manic state. So, uh, you know, these disruptions in rhythms have really been, um, been known for quite a while. And they seem to be very important in the precipitation of these episodes in people with these disorders. And a lot of our work over many years has been um, to try to determine what role these circadian rhythm disruptions have in mood regulation. So again, we use mouse models and, uh, and actually the mouse that I spoke about um, before where we were testing the, the compounds on these mice um, are mice that have a mutation in a gene called clock. And this is one of the genes that's centrally involved in the regulation of circadian rhythms. And these mice look very similar to, um, to people with bipolar disorder, particularly in the manic state. And so um, we've used these mice and, uh, and other tools to be able to sort of determine the, the molecular mechanisms of how circadian rhythms control mood, uh, how disruptions to this system might precipitate a mood episode, and, uh, you know, and also looking at treatments. So 
Uh, so one of the other um, interesting facts about valproic acid, as well as lithium, which is another um, first line treatment for bipolar disorder, is that they make circadian rhythms stronger. They seem to, to amplify circadian rhythms. And we also know that certain forms of psychotherapy, uh, in, for example, a, a treatment called um, interpersonal and social rhythm therapy, which is aimed at, at keeping people on a very strict sleep-wake and social schedule where they wake up the same time of day every day, go to sleep at the same time every day, you know, eat at the same times, et cetera, can really help to reduce the risk of, um, of precipitating an episode. And so, um, so we're using the knowledge that we have from mice now um, to be able to develop other treatments that might target the circadian system more directly to increase those rhythms, really make them more stable, and and hopefully prevent you know future episodes from happening. That sounds fantastic. Uh, hopefully, you'll have some good pharmaceutical treatments coming out of that uh, to help people uh, maintain their their rhythms. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. Well, cool. Um, so. So up until now, um, as I mentioned, uh, the, the scientific study of bipolar disorder has seemed to have received, in general, fewer resources for the neuroscientific community um, than uh, study of other diseases like schizophrenia or, or, or major depressive disorder. Um, wh why do you think there's less attention paid to it in neuroscience? And, and what can our viewers you know, perhaps do to contribute to improving the state of research in this field? So, yeah, you know, it's... Um it's tough to know exactly why uh, bipolar disorder hasn't uh, been accepted quite as well as a, as a true psychiatric disorder as compared to something like schizophrenia or even depression. I think there's been a lot of misconceptions about the disorder uh, for a long time. Um, people have thought, oh, it's just mood swings or it's something that people should have more control over. Um, and I, I think a lot of people don't really understand the severity of the disorder and um, how devastating it can really be to, to people and to family members. Um, and, it, you know, I think through science now, we're starting to appreciate a little bit more um, that, you know, it really is a biological disorder. It's something that's, um, that's not just somebody's choice. It's not that somebody has... Um, a problem controlling their emotions. It's, it's more of a, a true biological disorder. And in the research realm, you know, it's been very difficult to study because uh, the animal models are, are, are somewhat limited. You know, um, you can't ever have a perfect animal model of something as complex as bipolar disorder. Um, it's just not going to happen. We have animal models that we think are, are pretty good, like the clock mutant mice that I described. But for example, they go into a manic state and then they, they will cycle down to a sort of euthymic state or, or a normal sort of mood state, but they don't cycle into a depressive state. So that just makes them limited as, as a mouse model. And so it's been challenging to try to study uh, what's going on at a basic level because we don't have um, you know, perfect animal models. And it's just, it's something that's it's taken a really long time to try to even um, begin to dissect. But I do think now there is, as you mentioned, there's a lot of attention um, in the popular press now, um, which there wasn't before. I think there is an increased realization of the fact that uh, this is a, a real disorder. It's something that's, um, that can be very serious. And, and then on the scientific side, um, there's been a lot of progress, um, not only in, the, in trying to develop better mouse models and using those tools as, as our lab does, but also using um, things like uh, fibroblast cells that, that are isolated from patients to be able to begin to, um, to look at uh, what sort of biological processes are going on you know, from, from skin cell biopsies. Um, we're also starting a project in our lab. We just published our first paper on this recently, um, looking at human postmortem brain. So, looking at um, at changes that occur in um, in rhythms in gene expression in um, in the human brain. So that's very exciting. So I think this is going to get better. Um, it's just it's something that's sort of taken a while to really develop. And, and as far as how the viewers can be involved, you know, obviously through foundations like IMRO, um, there's other foundations that are specifically um, 
targeting bipolar disorder, the Stanley Foundation. Uh, there's the Brain and Behavioral Research Foundation, some other foundations that are, are also very interested in, um, in bipolar disorder. So um, they can learn more about the disorder through, um, through these foundations, through the National Institute of Mental Health. They have a lot of resources about bipolar disorder. And, uh, and donating to research is always uh, a great way to try to move, uh, move everything forward and try to develop better treatments. Thanks, Colleen, for the shout out <laughs> for Imro. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, as you say, it's a very complex condition and, and it does need a lot of good research being done to, to improve the, the treatments that people use. Um, and the treatments do need to be improved. So thanks for the work you do there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So if, if, uh, if you on on the Brainwaves page on the Imro website over the next few days, uh, are you ready to answer some questions there? Yes, absolutely. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So viewers, uh, thanks for watching. Um, if you have any questions for Dr. McClung um, on IMRO's website, please go to imhro.org slash brain dash waves. Uh, this link is on the, is on the hangout window as well. Um, and uh, you can ask your questions there through Friday, May 6th. Thanks so much for watching and uh, hope to see you there. Thanks, Colleen. All right. Thank you. Talk soon. Bye-bye.